Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenham. My name is Bruno Yoon, and I'm one of the Athenham Fellows this year. As college students, we are groomed in various ways to be professional. With professionalism comes a code of behavior, of dress and appearance, speech, and all sorts of other things. I can't be the only one who feels this way, but abiding by it sometimes feels oppressive. You're suppressing who you really are. You can't really be your full self, but you have to do it. It's part of the deal we make with society to pay the rent and buy the groceries and the Netflix subscriptions and the wine glass holders for the shower so you can drink wine in the shower. <laughs> now, on top of all of this, some people have it especially hard because they have to contend with certain stereotypes and societal expectations, particularly African Americans. Adia Harvey Wingfield, professor of sociology at Washington University in St. Louis, is here tonight to discuss how black professionals navigate the professional world. She graduated from Spelman College and then earned both her master's and doctorate in sociology from Johns Hopkins University. Wingfield has lectured internationally on her research. She has been published in numerous peer-reviewed journals and is a regular contributor to Inside Higher Ed, The Atlantic, and other popular outlets. Her most recent book is the award-winning No More Invisible Man, Race and Gender in Men's Work, which, by the way, is for sale in the lobby as you walk out. She received the 2018 Public Understanding of Sociology Award from the American Sociological Association. And Professor Wingfield's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Berger Institute for Work and Family. By the way, now is the time to adjust your seat if you haven't already done so. And as a reminder of the rules, I ask that you treat the Athenaeum like a movie theater in two ways. One, audio and visual recording, strictly prohibited, as always. Two, please take this opportunity to silence and put away for your cell phones. It really detracts from the experience if you use them, just like at the movies. Unlike the movies, though, you get to ask questions at the end. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Adia Harvey Wakefield. All right, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you everyone for uh, coming out this evening and coming to hear me talk about some of my recent research. Uh, as you see here, the title of my presentation is Professional Work in a Post-Racial Era, Black Healthcare Workers in the New Economy. And this is uh, some research that I've done recently uh, that stems with the type of research that I typically do, which is an assessment of how racial and gender inequality persist in professional workplaces. So what I'll talk about tonight is from my forthcoming book on this topic, which will be out in uh, late spring of 2019. I just got a press date from the publisher two days ago, so I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the book will be out in 2019, and it's uh, my attempt to try to understand and think a little bit more about how structural changes that are happening societally and in the economy are having an impact on black workers who are in professional jobs. So in order to try to understand black health care workers in the new economy and to try to make more sense of how these structural and economic and social changes are occurring, it's important to think about the contrast and the juxtaposition between what work used to be and what work is today. So if we think about what work used to be, this picture of work is one that I think uh, we hear people alluding to when they talk about the importance of growing the middle class and bringing back good jobs and solidifying groups who have generally been pretty dispossessed. But what does this actually mean and what does it look like? This uh, picture of what work used to be is a common representation of work in what I think of as the post-war work world after uh, World War II. And this was an era where work looked a lot different than it does now. People were much more likely to have a lot more job security in the sense that they would typically remain at one organization or company throughout the duration of their careers. People did not often bounce from company to company. Uh, there was little turnover or transition as a result of this. Organizations often paid pretty competitive benefits. This is the era where people could count on working for a company for their career and retiring with a pretty solid pension and feeling confident that the pension would be there and that they could uh, count on this sort of support. Uh, there also was a pretty robust middle management sector, uh, meaning that there was a pretty solid layer of middle management in most organizations. They were pretty hierarchical, and that people, if they were interested in and wanted to move up, would often be able to move up through their particular company where they worked. Now, it's important to also point out that when we talk about this post-war work world, these aspects of work were not available to everybody. Um, occupational segregation was rampant during this time period, which, means that which meant that primarily uh, white, able-bodied men were the people who were able to enjoy this post-war work era where work was plentiful and available and a route to economic success. 
And this is also an era where we have a pretty robust public sector and things like the GI Bill, for example, that offer government support for people interested in going back to school and buying houses and experiencing the mobility that, or the things that lead to mobility into a middle class lifestyle. So if this is what work used to be. What does work look like now? Very different, right? A lot of the things that I mentioned are not really in place anymore for workers today. Today we see declining unionization in both the public and the private spheres. Uh, the numbers of workers who belong to unions have uh, sharply dropped over the past, uh, say, 30 or so years. Uh, workers also experience less job security. So we don't necessarily have this picture anymore of people who go to work for one company and stay in that company over the course of time. Workers can be fired at will or engage in employment contracts where they can leave or let go or be let go at will. Uh, which, um, on the bright side, some argue, leads to more autonomy and self-direction. So the idea here is that if workers are able to uh, switch jobs more frequently, they can move from job to job and be more likely to find things that they feel work better for them. And now we see that, on average, workers shift jobs on average about eight times over the course of their career, sometimes going from industry to industry, in an effort to move up or to maintain economic stability. Organizations are also flatter. That level of middle management has largely disappeared from many organizations. And workers take on a lot more responsibility for benefits than they had in the past. So if we think about this model of people committing to an organization and the organization responding to that commitment by offering more economic security in the form of retirement benefits, not really so much anymore. Workers are expected to offer much more, uh, much more contributions to retirement accounts, to um, health insurance, and things like that. Organizations are different in the sense that they offer more stated support for diversity. So whereas I mentioned that this post-war work world was one where uh, the types of work that were available were primarily available to white, able-bodied men, organizations now will say that it's important to achieve diversity or at least to prioritize diversity as something that matters. But I argue that overall, what we look at now when we think about how work is structured is a frayed contract between organizations and employees. Organizations don't provide the same level of resources, economic benefits, and support that they used to provide for workers in the past. And as a result, we know from research that workers experience a lot of economic and emotional uncertainty. We see examples of this in the 2008 re recession. Research in the aftermath of that period shows that a lot of workers feel really uncertain and scared and nervous about their prospects in this economy, whether they'll be able to uh, afford to retire, send children to college, make sure that they can afford their health insurance payments, or make sure that they can maintain themselves if uh, health care situations strike. So we can sum this up in describing this as uh, an example of what the new economy looks like today. Many sociologists and economists use this term. And in the new economy, professional work exists as one of few routes to economic security. There are, as my colleague Ernie Caliber refers to, a widening gulf between uh, good jobs and bad jobs. Good jobs being the ones that do provide some economic stability, autonomy, and security. Bad jobs being the ones that do none of those things and leave workers really uh, floundering and flailing in the current economy. Professional work is generally categorized in, as an example of the sort of good jobs that are available. Uh, workers here benefit from technological advances. They benefit from the growth of the knowledge economy. And this is where we're likely to see a lot of the focus on diversity dialogue. Now, I have here minimal results because a lot of my colleagues in sociology will argue that despite the fact that many organizations talk a lot more about wanting to diversify, this doesn't always match up with the reality or, uh, or visible consequences in what actually happens in organizations. But what I wanted to think about with this project was to try to understand what this new economy means for black professionals. If we we live in this world where this new economy is one where professional work still is remaining kind of stable, but there's this widening gulf between, between good jobs and uh, what Kalleberg refers to as bad jobs. And if workers who are in this uh, new economy and good jobs and professional work are in positions where there's more of a focus on diversity, more of a focus on wanting to change, what does that mean for black professionals who are employed in these sorts of jobs? How does this sort of structural shift have an impact on them? So there are some existing theories that can give us some ideas and some insights into what we might expect. Uh, my colleagues George Wilson, Vinnie Rossigno, and Matt Huffman have noted that there's been a lot of downward mobility, particularly for black men, as the public sector privatizes. And what they mean here is that when we think about eras that in the pa or areas that in the past have been areas where black workers could achieve some semblance of middle class stability, often this was in the public sector. Uh, but as public sector uh, jobs and resources have started to decline, in many, in many cases state governments or federal governments privatize their services. And 
and leave uh, and neglect to do some of the things that they had been doing in the past. So these colleagues of mine argue that as public sector, as the public sector has become has begun to become more private, the consequence of this has been that many black men are pushed out of the areas that had historically been routes to middle class security. Uh, Sharon Collins and Frank Dobbin argue that organizations have largely, largely failed at their efforts at increasing diversity. Uh, there are a number of reasons why they argue that this is the case, but they make the point that if we look at who is in the uppermost ranks of most organizations, the goals for achieving diversity have not actually matched the reality. Finally, my coworker Jake Rosenfeld has argued that declining unionization actually exacerbates racial wage inequality, and this is true in both public and private sector jobs. So these give us some pretty useful insights. Uh, they tell us a lot about the sort of structural shifts that are happening and how those structural shifts are having an impact on black professionals at the aggregate. But what they don't really give us any insights into are how black professionals themselves are dealing with work transformation, right? We know that these sorts of changes are happening, that these are resulting in racial wage inequality, resulting in minimal diversity at top level of organizations, that black professional men in particular may be experiencing declining mobility. But what does it mean to be a worker who's coping with those things and also a black professional? How are black professionals reacting to and responding to these sorts of changes? Are they pursuing other avenues of work? Are they trying to change the workplaces that they're in? These are questions that we can't really answer from the existing research that's talking mostly about these structural changes. So the core questions that were guiding my research are that I wanted to understand what the new economy means for blacks doing professional work. As many sectors in the new economy become more privatized, stratified, and, and unequal, where and how do black professionals fall? What are their challenges, opportunities? Who are the winners and losers? And this was the general framing that guided the thoughts that I had going into this book project. So healthcare to me strikes me as a really uh, useful site for examining these questions a little bit further. And I argue in the book that if we think about how healthcare has changed, a lot of the changes in healthcare reflect these broader structural changes that we've been discussing. When it comes to the privatization of the public sector, for example, this has had real stark consequences for the healthcare industry and in that it's led to what I refer to uh, as sort of a tiered system of healthcare, where there is a private system where well-off, healthy, quote, responsible patients are able to access private facilities use private insurance and get the best care. And there's a public system that involves minimally funded public sector care available to everybody else. And like much of our economy, where we see this shift in this dichotomy between good jobs and bad jobs, this um, divergence between the public sector, public, excuse me, private system of healthcare and the public system of healthcare is really growing and widening in ways that have pretty dramatic consequences. These changes are also emerging in tandem with changes in U.S. racial demographics. So in other words, as our country is becoming increasingly uh, populated by people of color, we're also seeing this shift in how healthcare is managed in practice to the point where this system of private care is becoming available to a smaller and smaller segment of the population with public sector care available to all others. And this is also occurring as routes to professional work have become less stable. So at the same time that uh, there's dwindling access to the sorts of state-sponsored or publicly funded resources like the GI Bill that I mentioned before that have historically allowed people to access these sorts of professional jobs. Professional jobs are getting more and more scarce, they're getting harder and harder to come by, but they're still remaining this um, uh, bastion of good jobs that can afford people economic security. And we see this again happening in healthcare as we see the split between uh, private and public systems emerging. So just to give a little bit of demographic data on black professionals in healthcare, these are some percentages that I pulled together just to show uh, where black workers are most underrepresented in various fields. You'll see that when it comes to medicine, this is where we see the lowest numbers of black physicians represented at 4%, a number that's actually remained pretty constant over the course of the 20th century, which is pretty bleak and depressing. Uh, we also see that uh, black workers are underrepresented as EMTs and paramedics, as well as physician assistants. Uh, numbers start to reach parity uh, when we get to around registered nurses and certain areas of technical work. But by and large, uh, black healthcare, despite the stated intention of wanting to become more diverse, still exists as a place where black professionals are largely underrepresented in most fields in the, the area. So the research questions that I'll talk about for today uh, stem from, again, my attempts to wrestle with these broader questions. But rather than focus on everything that I talk about in the book, 
Today I'll talk specifically about this issue of diversity. So if we start with this question of how work transformation in the new economy is affecting black professionals, diversity ideology is one core area where we see a lot of these changes happening in that the healthcare industry and medicine and nursing in particular has become a lot more focused on uh, this idea that they need to do something about uh, creating more diversity within the industry and within, within the field. This diversity ideology has become pretty mainstream in medicine and nursing. Um, the question that I asked for this presentation is about the impact that this has on black professionals. How do these workers navigate and deal with work in an environment where professional jobs are becoming uh, still a route to good jobs becoming more difficult to access? How do they cope with the fact that these jobs that are becoming harder to get into now say that they want to experience and achieve more diversity? How are black workers dealing with those sorts of changes? In order to answer these questions, I engaged in intensive semi-structured interviews with 75 healthcare workers, 60 were blacks, uh, 15 were white, and the healthcare workers came from a range of occupations. They were doctors, nurses, physician assistants, and technicians. Interviews generally lasted about one to two hours and took place in a variety of settings. Uh, some were at respondents' workplaces, others were in my office, some were at neutral locations such as coffee shops. Uh, I also was able to include some questions on the American Panel Survey, which is a nationally representative survey of 2,000 adults that Washington University distributes um, uh, quarterly over the course of a year. And I was able to include a few questions to go out to survey respondents about their perceptions of race and medicine and potential responses they would have to being treated by a black doctor. And finally, I did field observations in three settings. I was able to shadow three different uh, black doctors in different settings, one in a, po in a private facility, one in a public sector hospital, and one in a university hospital. And I'm happy to talk during the Q&A about any questions anyone has about um, methods in particular. But on to the findings. Interestingly, when it comes to the rise of diversity discourse and dialogue, despite becoming more mainstream and commonplace, I found that most of my respondents noted that diversity initiatives left them apathetic, indifferent, or in some cases even annoyed with their overall existence. Now, this respondents generally did not support these types of initiatives as they were present at their workplaces. And this is not because they didn't believe in diversity. It wasn't that they felt that it didn't matter or that it was unnecessary, but rather most of my respondents argued that diversity efforts did not reflect their racial work experiences and that there was enough of a disconnect between the ways in which diversity initiatives were put into practice and the sorts of experiences that they had that they didn't really see the value in the ways that the organizations where they worked were constructing or engaging in diversity um, efforts and initiatives. Now this varies by occupational status and it varies by gender in ways that I'll talk about now, but overall uh, the general response for most of my respondents uh, varied from skepticism to irritation to suspicion about how and why diversity initiatives were being put into place. When it comes to black doctors, uh, the sort of specific diversity initiatives that they usually were subjected to were cultural competence trainings. And so what they told me was that when it came to cultural competence trainings, they would do online modules or courses that encourage cultural competence, where they're taught to uh, be mindful and think critically about how a, a patient's cultural background might have an impact on the ways in which they are being treated or what they might request or how they might want to uh, respond to medical treatment. But overall, my respondents pretty generally, pretty much across the board, viewed these as unnecessary bureaucratic hurdles. The statement of another box to check came up frequently when, res when respondents talked about doing cultural competence training. They saw this as an unnecessary bureaucratic hurdle because it seemed disconnected from the ways that they saw race affecting their work. So when I asked respondents a little bit more about that, if cultural competence training is so distinct from what you're actually experiencing at work, then what do your workplace experiences look like? Why doesn't cultural competence training reflect that? And most respondents told me, interestingly, that they didn't encounter overt everyday racial aggressions, the sort of microaggressions or harassment that we hear about a lot in current research and literature. Instead, they argued that race affected them through structural and cultural processes. And so with race embedded in structural avenues, gender became a much more obvious form of overt bias for black women who were physicians. So what does this mean specifically? Here's a quote from Randy, who's an emergency medicine doctor. And he was one of the first doctors who kind of scoffed when I asked him his thoughts about diversity initiatives and training in his workplace. And he told me, it's the right idea, but that stuff doesn't mean anything. Nobody takes it seriously. Obviously, I think more diversity is important. It's necessary. 
But the way they do it, the trainings and modules, it's just one more box to check. They just want quick fixes. Doing the hard work, really changing the profession to get more black and brown people in here, that's not sexy. So we see here an example in this quote of the ways in which doctors are kind of marginally tolerant but pretty dismissive of how diversity initiatives are put into place. For doctors from Randy's perspective, the work that really has to be done in order to completely and genuinely transform medicine, that's a lot harder than simply doing a cultural competence training. And he doesn't see that level of commitment to that sort of work from most of his colleagues at the hospital where he works. Here's Allison, who's a geneticist. And this is a really interesting quote because this gets at the ways in which the structural barriers that are present for, in medicine were a lot more salient for her than the sort of overt, um, kind of obvious forms of aggression that we might expect to find among these sorts of workers. So when I asked Allison how she thought race had an impact on her work, she told me, it's impacted my work just because my interests are focused more so on health disparities, medically underserved populations, minorities, those who often do not know about genetic resources or genetic services that are available. And I find it difficult to identify mentors or people who are familiar with those populations, people who are also passionate about educating those populations about genetic services or resources. So I have not really had much luck identifying people who are working with those populations who can help me better address some of the needs or some of the disparities that I see. So this is a pretty important quote because what Allison is telling me here is that for her, uh, structural issues in terms of the underrepresentation of people of color in the medical profession are what really have an impact on her ability or her perception of her ability to thrive and succeed in the field. It's not that she goes to work and deals with overt racial harassment from patients or coworkers. What happens to her though is that the low numbers of racial minorities and people of color in medical school and in genetics specifically means that she finds herself at a disadvantage when it comes to getting the sort of mentoring and training that she needs to succeed in the field. And that's what I mean when I talk about some examples of some of the structural problems that plague uh, black workers who are in medicine. It's not so much that they are dealing with a constant barrage of hostility, it's much more so that the structural processes that can keep people of color out of medicine still serve to have a deleterious impact on them when it comes to trying to get their work done. This is a quote from Edgar here, uh, an internal medicine doctor. And Edgar was the first respondent who gives what I refer to as the that one time experience. And this is how I categorize the respondents who talk about how when it comes to interpersonal experiences with racial bias, they have what I refer to as the that one time account. There was that one time when this thing happened and this person said something I didn't like, but that was a one time thing. That's not the totality of my experience. So Edgar's that one time experience. He says, so I can think of one time when I was working in the ER, and God bless him, there was a fellow who came in who was pissed drunk, having chest pains, had no insurance. I'm the only one manning the ER. He comes in and decides he wasn't going to let no N-word doctor take care of him. So he fixed me by getting up and walking out. That was beyond my control. That was his cultural bias that basically put his life on the line. It's extremely rare for me. I have not, I think I may have had, that may have been one of only two experiences that I've had in 30-something years of white patients that were negative. So again, this is a pretty telling example because it puts into stark relief the way that for a doctor like Edgar, who's an internal medicine doctor, these sorts of experiences are pretty rare. And this was consistent with what most of the other doctors in my study told me. When it comes to these sorts of overt experiences, there's that one, the, the that one time account. But the biases and problems that make it harder for them in medicine are much more the structural ones that Allison refers to in genetics. I also note that when it comes to the fact that these sorts of barriers are much more structural, this has clear implications and consequences for black women in medicine. And this is illustrated in this quote from Aisha, who's a neonatologist, who told me that uh, for her, gender was much more so the more salient factor limiting her work ability and advancement than race was. And when I asked her why, she said, because I see my coworkers that are males and the race doesn't matter. If you're male, they will call you a doctor. If you're female, they will call you a nurse. But it's regardless of your race. Like I see my white coworkers, even just because they're female, they still call them nurse. If they're male, they're a doctor. If they're female, they're a nurse. But the race doesn't really matter. It's the male versus female. That's more important than the race. So what I argue here is that for black women in medicine, this experience of race being a more structural or cultural process makes it a lot more of an abstraction. They're aware that race is having an impact on their work, but they see it more so in terms of artificially depleting the numbers of mentors that they can have, or broader cultural stereotypes about black inferiority that they have to really excel and work hard to offset. But because these issues are so much more abstract, the daily, <coughs> excuse me, 
the daily uh, routine experience of gender bias and overt gender related issues in medicine become much more salient and much more obvious and much more overt. The consequences of this though are that when it comes to the ways in which cultural competence trainings are set up, none of these things get addressed by how these doctors experience cultural competence training. So it's not that these doctors have uh, these work experiences that are completely bereft of any sort of issue that leads them to think that diversity doesn't matter. They certainly don't feel that way. But they also note that the sorts of experiences and encounters that they have are one, structural, two, being affected by issues related to gender, and are occurring in ways that make existing diversity initiatives seem pretty irrelevant to their work experiences. Now, when it comes to nurses, I got very different responses. Nurses argued that uh, they worked largely in institutions that claimed to be diverse places, but they felt that these claims were not reflected in their interactions. Nurses routinely described explicitly racist exchanges with their white colleagues, but they also observed structural processes that disadvantaged black nurses, and this discrepancy made them a lot more mistrustful of diversity rhetoric due to the different racial realities of their work. So whereas doctors were more likely to feel that the diversity initiatives that were put in place were perhaps well-intentioned but poorly executed, nurses were very suspicious. <coughs> Excuse me. Nurses were very suspicious. <coughs> and this was largely because they were in positions where they experienced, is this, sorry, I think I coughed out my, my headset. Is this still working? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, nurses were largely in positions where their daily experiences with racial harassment that often went either unnoticed or ignored or unpunished by supervisors and higher up left them very suspicious of whether or not their organizations were really serious about creating the diversity that they claimed to want. Their feeling was more along the lines that if organizations wanted to create changes, they would start with addressing the sorts of experiences that I'm having. But the fact that they don't makes me feel like uh, organizations are simply saying what they need to to cover their tracks and keep themselves safe. Here's an example from Stephen, an orthopedic nurse. And when I asked him about his perceptions of diversity in his workplace, he told me, when you look at the settings, the more people say that they're diverse, the more that they are not diverse. They're diverse on paper because you have to be. But if you're diverse on paper, you ought to be diverse in practice. You can't, one cannot go without the other. And when I say that, I say that to mean that when you're stating that you are a diverse program, your nursing staff should reflect that. I know of one school where in the fall of 2011, they admitted 50 students into the nursing program and none of them were African American. So that was not very representative, thank you so much. That was not very representative of what their mission is. So Stephen gives this example of the sort of mistrust and doubts that a lot of black nurses had about the institutions where they worked. They saw these as places where it was easy to make pronouncements and offer kind of lip service about how diversity was valued. But when it came to actually what happened in practice, their um, statements, the reality did not seem to match the statements that were offered. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Here's a quote from Janet, who's a pediatric nurse. And Janet gives some examples, <coughs> sorry. Janet gives an example of the ways in which nurses were likely to identify some of the structural processes that worked to their disadvantage in the profession. Janet told me, the push is to have all nurses, the entry level be a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and not community college or diploma programs. So those nurses who do attend community college or diploma programs actually may find that they struggle a little bit more to obtain a job than those with a bachelor's degree. How many black nurses go to community colleges because the tuition is less expensive? Or maybe it's a little bit easier to get into the program in terms of just the numbers of people that they accept or the feasibility of having a family and going to a community college. So nursing is in this uh, period of time right now where there's a push for higher professional standards. And a lot of the respondents that I talked to were aware that clearly you want nurses to be as skilled and qualified as possible. But they also noted that this push towards higher professional standards could inadvertently serve to disadvantage black nurses who may not necessarily have the time or the finances to be able to attend the four-year colleges, that, the four-year colleges that were becoming places where people needed to have degrees from in order to go into nursing programs. What they're pointing out here is that when it comes to the sort of issues that are affecting uh, black nurses, structural biases are a problem in parallel but different ways from how they are present for black people working in medicine. Here's an example from Mindy, a mother baby nurse who moved away from the sort of structural challenges to talk more about the interpersonal issues that uh, shaped how race affected her work. And she told me about an exchange, an exchange that she had with a coworker. She said, she began by saying, 
I was just kind of noticing that there was just kind of this demeanor of how dare you be in intensive care because basically because of your race. It never starts out as things that they say right out. They start, some nurses, some white nurses will kind of not say anything, but just kind of, they don't come right out and say it. It's the way that they look at you when you notice the subtle differences. But long story short, someone actually said to me, we were talking about after work getting together, hanging out and said, oh, you can come to my house, but you'd have to be carrying a pail and wearing a rag on your head to come to my home. So this sort of comment uh, pretty clearly equates uh, Mindy, a professional and a coworker, with somebody who would only be suitable in this coworker's house as a cleaning person. But it's important to point out that this sort of response is very different from what I heard from uh, the doctors who were in the study. Whereas doctors would categorize these sorts of overt racial experiences as, as being the that one time phenomenon, nurses were more likely to say, how much time do you have for this interview? Because this thing happened to me yesterday, and then last week there was this other incident, and then two weeks ago my supervisor said this thing that was totally inappropriate, and then last month there was this other issue. And to be clear, Mindy shared this example and a number of others with me during her interview. This was only one of several uh, pretty egregious examples that she shared of dealing with these sorts of comments and statements from coworkers. So for nurses, often the perspective is that uh, if they're experiencing these types of issues in the workplace on a regular basis, organizations that put out statements in support of diversity are not really serious or focused on addressing the sorts of challenges that, are, that need to be addressed in order to really create workplaces that are diverse and inclusive for everyone. So finally, I'll move on to technicians, who ironically were the most hopeful about diversity initiatives. But before we get excited, this was not because they believed that these initiatives would actually help them. Diversity rhetoric is actually rarely applied to lower status workers, and that was true for the technicians in my study and is true for lower status workers generally across the board. Uh, technicians <clears throat> did not expect that existing diversity policies would address what they experienced, which were often hostile racial interactions with patients and nurses, but they did believe that initiatives might help nurses and doctors treat patients of color more effectively. So their optimism stemmed from this idea that while they were often mistreated, particularly from nurses who are above them in the occupational hierarchy, their hope was that if these nurses were experiencing diversity training and getting support for, or getting some sort of uh, exposure to ways that they could behave differently at work, that might hopefully lead nurses to treat other patients differently from the way that these technicians themselves were being treated. Here's a quote from Amber, who's a cardiac monitor technician. And Amber was letting me know that she wasn't really too hopeful that uh, diversity training would have a direct impact on her because of the work that she did, but that she still held out hope that it could yield some results. She told me, I don't think that it'll impact the work that I do just because of my minimal patient contact that I have. But as far as everyone else, I do believe that it'll impact them. I'm thinking of the nurses and doctors that are being trained. It might make them go a little bit more of the extra mile to make sure everyone is comforted and kind of on the same level. Of course, they always go the extra mile, but now it's just adding another key role. So here we have Amber saying specifically that as a technician, diversity initiatives are likely not going to have much of an impact on her work. But her hope is that for doctors and nurses, uh, nurses in particular were the people with whom she had a lot of specific conflicts that mirrored much more what I shared from nurses, having some exposure to diversity training would hopefully lead nurses to treat patients a little bit more kindly and thoughtfully and uh, not to treat them in the same way that they treated her. This is a quote from Callie, a patient care technician, who gives some insights into the sort of uh, exposure, excuse me, experiences that technicians have that I think is largely related to their role in the occupational hierarchy. So Callie told me, okay, so not too long ago I had this patient and I came to her room to get her baby. It was time to do the baby vitals and to do the PKU on the baby and her family was in there, her dad was in there. So when I came in, I did her vitals and then I asked her could I take the baby and I told her I would be back in about 10 minutes. And her dad started going off because she was handing me the baby and he was like, what are you doing? And she was like, oh dad, please don't start. And he was like, you don't know who she is, she's just coming in here grabbing the baby and she could be anyone, look at her. I looked at him and I'm like, well, here's my badge. My badge had flipped around, so I turned it around and he was like, that's the problem here. Don't let anyone work here. You people are lucky to be here. So again, this is a much more stark example of the sort of racial encounters that technicians were likely to experience at work that's much more similar to what uh, nurses describe than it is to, doctors, what, to what doctors describe. But again, this illustrates part of why technicians are skeptical that these sorts of diversity initiatives are really going to have a direct impact on them. Offering diversity trainings to workers is not necessarily going to offset the sort of challenges that Callie as a patient care technician encounters from 
patients and patients' families. But at the same time, the distance that technicians had from the sort of diversity initiatives that were put in place was enough to give them some sort of optimism and hope that perhaps these trainings would lead to some brighter spots for patients, even if they weren't necessarily going to have an impact on them. So I'll conclude uh, with just a couple of points uh, to take away from the, this part of the project. When we think about how uh, work is changing and what's happening in the new economy, I've argued that uh, mainstreaming diversity talk is one key example of this, that organizations now are a lot more comfortable and a lot more willing to talk openly about the importance of becoming more diverse and uh, being more inclusive in terms of worker populations and those to whom they, they are serving, or those whom they are serving. But what diversity really means, I show here, depends a lot on occupational status. That for doctors, how diversity is constructed looks one way. For nurses, it looks a different way. And for technicians, it still looks a different way uh, as well. And overall, the common ground from most of these respondents is that diversity initiatives and discourse still don't serve to effectively address the racial realities that black professionals face in the new economy. These racial realities are driven by both structural and interpersonal factors. And they vary by occupation and have gendered dimensions. But this aspect of work, excuse me, work transformation overall still is leaving black professionals disillusioned and disengaged with how organizations are trying to make changes. Now, because I like to end presentations on a positive note and not leave everybody down and depressed, I do think that there is some hope to take from this presentation. I think it's not all a sad story. One of the things that I argue in the book is that there's room for organizations to make the sort of changes that would address some of the challenges that are present here and perhaps offer more support and buy-in from the workers who could be really pivotal and useful in trying to create organizational change. But I think, <coughs> I think that this has to start, sorry. I think that this has to start, first of all, with organizations uh, restructuring themselves in ways that allow them to rebuild the sort of social contract that they used to have in prior eras. Uh, with workers who were part of organizations. So rather than organizations continuing to move into this model in the new economy, where there's growing distance between organizations as, as um, institutions and workers who are part of their constituents, I think organizations can move towards being a little bit more mindful of how minority workers and black workers in particular in their employ are experiencing work in these institutions. I think doing that could take the form of actually uh, seeking feedback from black workers at a variety of organizational levels and actually devoting organizational resources to addressing and trying to solve or resolve some of these problems. I also think organizations can work at making sure that the diversity solutions that they put into place don't paint with too broad a brush. One of the things that I learned from this project is that if we're talking about diversity initiatives, organizations offer kind of general broad solutions and a one-size-fits-all sort of approach that isn't necessarily tailored to a broad array of professional statuses and professional occupations. So I think it would be incumbent for organizations to actually move towards uh, learning more from the, from the employees that they hire, but also taking the sorts of issues that they face seriously and tailoring solutions to those particular groups. And I think once organizations begin doing that, this will be a model towards creating workplaces that are not only more inclusive, but more productive for many of the workers in their employ. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll now have time for questions. Uh, please raise your hand if, you're if you'd like to ask a question. As always, priority goes to students, and please do try to keep them brief. Hi, thank you so much for coming today to speak with us about this topic. Uh, my name is Sasha, I'm a senior here at CMC. And I'd like to preface my question uh, by talking about one of my friends who um, worked over this past summer at a large finance firm in their diversity and inclusion um, uh, sort of unit. And I think this was a newly created unit. And so my question is, with newly created diversity you know, um, sectors in a large organization, what are the biggest challenges they face um, in making sure that you know people of um, all races and all sexes, you know, feel welcome in working there and, you know, being productive and what are the solutions to those largest challenges? That's a great question. I think with a lot of um, uh, new initiatives, but even with some older ones, the challenges that organizations face in effectively diversifying are actually documented by some research that some of my colleagues have done. Um, my, one of whom I mentioned here, Frank Dobbin, along with uh, Alexandra Caleb and Aaron Kelly, has actually shown that often organizations 
go about diversifying in ways that aren't effective. They did a study of, I think, about 800 private sector companies and found that most companies either um, try to employ diversity trainings and seminars or they try to institutionalize mentoring programs. And in a few cases, in least frequently, they try to actually establish diversity offices that have resources and funding and time management uh, support to those outcomes. So what they show is that diversity trainings are actually the least effective way of creating more diversity. They upset everybody. They create backlash from uh, white respondents or white participants often. They are stressful for participants of color. They do very little to actually lead to moving the needle. Mentoring programs show some modest successes for black women, but not for other groups. But by and large, overall, what they found was that when organizations have someone who is in a managerial role who is tasked with creating more diversity, when that person has resources, when they have the support of the organization, and perhaps most importantly, when they know that their job stability or having a job is incumbent on making sure that they actually complete these tasks, that's when we actually see this sort of work being done effectively, which kind of makes sense, right? Because nobody wants to get fired. So when people know that that could actually happen, they, they get the job done. But what uh, the authors of the study show is that that's the least common type of diversity initiative to be put into place. Organizations, by and large, go with the ones that don't work, and then often get frustrated that things are not working and either double down or they give up, but they rarely pivot to the types that have shown to have actual successes. And I think that for uh, new initiatives, unless they are staffed by people who are familiar with the literature or who have done the research, it's very easy to go with what seems commonplace and what's easy, right? So I would say that I think the big challenge for uh, new diversity offices is to make sure that they are really up on and aware of the research that's out there. And it's not only in sociology, there are business professors who work on this also, but there is research and evidence-based uh, data that shows what type of work is more likely to create change and what type of work isn't. And for organizations that are really genuinely, ser genuinely serious about doing this, Actually following what the data show, I think, is the way of avoiding those type of pitfalls. Oh. Hi, my name's Dave Stedman. I'm a senior. <laughs> Did you do any work with caseworkers or social workers? No, I didn't include caseworkers or social workers in the study, although their work uh, kind of overlaps with the medical field and is um, related to what a lot of healthcare workers do. I wanted to focus specifically I wanted to focus specifically on doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants, and technicians because I wanted to stay squarely grounded within healthcare specifically, and I wanted to focus on areas where I knew that black workers had historically been underrepresented so that I could talk about uh, or tie their experiences to a lot of the changes that have been happening in healthcare specifically, the rise of women in the medical profession, the uh, shrinking public sector and what that means for public hospitals and things like that. Um, hello, my name is Brian. I'm a Pomona first year. Um, I was wondering what we can do as uh, black or otherwise young people going into the uh, professional work field in the next decade. And what was the last part of the question? In, in the next decade, like what can we do? In the next do? decade. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, one of the arguments that I make in the book is that uh, in response to a lot of these structural um, issues that are present, uh, workers of color do a lot of labor for the organization to try to change workplaces and make them more palatable and accessible. So sometimes they do it because they want to and they feel like it's important. Other times they do it because they feel as though they're getting an implicit or explicit message from the organization that they should be doing it. But they end up carrying a lot of water for the organization. Often it's unpaid, it's often uncompensa uncompensated, it's often unacknowledged, but it still is really critical for how the organization functions. So I think that for uh, people of color who are going to be going into workplaces, I think it's important to make sure that if you're going in and you're doing this extra work, which is often going to be the case, right? Because for a variety of reasons, people want to make their workplaces better. And for people of color, they find it incumbent upon themselves to do the work of making their workplaces better. It's important to also push your workplace to the extent that you can to be aware of and mindful of the labor that workers of color are doing, right? So part of what I talk about in the chapter on doctors is that uh, 
given the ways that race is impacting um, doctors at work and given the fact that it's so structural, they often attempt to try to change structural processes to widen the pipeline for other interested doctors of color. But they do this on their own time, which is minimal because doctors are super overworked. They do it without the organization kind of offering any compensation or support or thank you or acknowledgement or anything like that. And I think that's where change has to happen. It's not so much that people who are workers are not doing this work, but I think the next step has to be making sure that organizations change to acknowledge and reflect that people are doing this work, right? How can you, for example, tie compensation to the additional labor that doctors are doing if they are disproportionately treating people who are uh, poor from backgrounds where health complications are likely to be more, uh, more pronounced? There's discussion about that in some areas, but I think that it's not enough for people who are workers to try to make changes if organizations are not also reflecting those changes. So I would just encourage people going into the workforce not to think about what you're doing in a vacuum, but also think about how what you're doing can and should be part of what your organization is doing, right? Should you be the one doing additional mentoring and service work, or should your organization have programs in place to do that? If you're going to do it, should your organization just kind of take advantage of your work, or should they be paying you for the extra labor that you provide? I tend to think that it's it's the latter. So I would encourage people to be mindful of how what they're doing ties to organizations and how you can really push the organizations to take that extra step. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm a sophomore at CMC and something that a couple of my friends and I are trying to figure out this year is how to put a program in place to bring more professors of color to CMC particularly. As a professor of color and based on your research, do you have any ideas on what we could do to like not only ensure that it's successful, but to like ensure that it's like a fostering and welcoming environment? Yeah, that, sorry, I thought I heard something else, but I guess I did not. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that there are steps that universities can take to make sure that there is a more welcoming environment for workers of color, for academics of color specifically. Uh, one, I think the critical mass strategy really helps a lot. So it's really useful to not just bring in kind of one or two people in isolated areas, but to try to bring in people so that in their departments where they work, they have uh, a critical mass of colleagues of color. Uh, another colleague that I know um, who was at a department where they were able to have a number of uh, workers of color said that she knew that they had reached a tipping point when she got to the point where but she, there were enough women in her department that they didn't all have to agree with each other, right? That they could kind of openly disagree and not all feel like they had to unite and push for certain things, but there were enough of them that they could have diverse points of view. So I think it's a goal to try to hire um, a critical mass. I think another important strategy is to try to uh, bring in senior academics in particular, because they tend to be people who have more uh, stability and able to kind of speak out about things and take risks and take more leadership roles and positions like that. For junior people, uh, I think the focus is solely on getting tenure, at least until you get tenure, and it's hard to be, um, uh, it's not hard to be part of the institutional fabric, but it's hard to think about much else than getting tenure when you do not have tenure. So I would suggest Going for a mass of people, ideally at the same time if possible, trying to bring in senior faculty of color and to think about whether or not there are administrative roles that people could be playing in order to help um, change the structure of the university as well, rather than just simply being in um, uh, faculty positions. Those do offer ways to create university change, but often I found that when there are people who are in uh, vice provost roles or even provost roles or in deans of a college or in an influential place, then that's where uh, you really see people, if their focus is on achieving these goals, that's where you really see the progress being made. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your, um, your talk. Um, so I, you mentioned that you conducted 15 interviews with white professionals. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering what you, were, uh, what you wanted to get out of that and if you found any interesting um, insights that you could share with us about it. Yeah, the interviews with white professionals were intended to see if there were areas where contrast would emerge between what black professionals told me and what white professionals told me. Um, and so I don't use, 
At one point, I had some of that data in the book, and then I ended up cutting it during the, re the revision process. But I do plan to use some of it for some uh, articles that I'm working on for peer review. So uh, I think the key areas where I saw interesting contrast had to do with why people went into the field in the first place. Uh, for a lot of black healthcare workers, the motivations had to do with these issues that were explicitly, explicitly related to uh, things around race, wanting to reduce racial health disparities, wanting to give back to communities from which they'd, they'd come. I didn't hear that as much from white professionals. Um, and that linked to this idea about the social role that is, the, the social aspects of medicine. I had a really interesting quote, and this was a quote, one of the quotes that I took out of the book because I had to in the revision process, but I had two anesthesiologists who were both around the same age, both were men, but one was black and one was white. And so in my interview with the black anesthesiologist, we talked about um, what he felt was the social context of healthcare. And he stressed that across the board, you've got to be mindful of the social environments that people come from and that we can't kind of distance medical care from people's backgrounds and that it's critical to do medicine well. You have to be mindful of these social issues, right? I did, like I said, this interview with a white anesthesiologist around the same age, asked him the same question, and he told me, uh, I don't really think that matters for what I'm doing. I could see maybe if you're doing, um, uh, I think the examples he gave were gynecology or internal, not internal medicine, I can't remember offhand, but he gave me two examples of fields where he thought maybe the social, the social thing might be important. But uh, his, then he went on to say that for him, if he were revamping medical school curriculums, he would emphasize uh, the business aspects of healthcare, ethics, and then maybe after all that stuff is when you get to the social context. And his argument was that as an, in, as an anesthesiologist, it didn't matter that much because all you're doing is giving, not all you're doing, but your primary responsibility is to give people anesthesia. So the social context of medicine are less relevant. But it was so interesting to me that two people who were so comparably situated offered such divergent responses around this social aspect of, of care. So that was that's just one example and there were others, but uh, that was exactly why I did the interviews with some white respondents because I suspected that some things like that might emerge where I would get Respondents and some responses from some uh, black respondents that would end up being totally different and reflect a completely different standpoint and perspective than from white respondents. Hi, I'm Janice, a CMC freshman. Um, you've done a pretty extensive research on STEM and being a professional in STEM, and you yourself are a professional in the humanities as being a teacher, so I'm wondering, in that, in your own personal experience and in your research, was there any overlap or any compare and contrasting that you did with yourself with all the interviews you conducted and all the things that you learned about uh, black professionals? Sure. Well, we actually think of sociology as more of a social science than a humanities. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but actually, given that, I think that the comparable areas were less disciplinary, I think, and more in terms of my um, kind of positionality as an interviewer. And so what I mean by that is that uh, I think that being a black woman professional interviewing mostly other black professionals put me in a position where it helped to facilitate um, uh, a sense of rapport among interviewees, I think a lot more easily than uh, disciplinary background might have. I think that respondents, uh, well, I know this because respondents said so, that my experience or my status as a black woman professor made them assume or feel that I kind of understood a lot of what they were telling me without them necessarily having to go into to detail. There were a lot of cases in this project and in my previous one where respondents would offer some insight and they would say, but you know what I'm talking about. And I would say, well, I think I do, but you still have to say it because I have to get it on tape so I can transcribe. <laughs> I can't put words in your mouth, even though in most cases I thought that I did understand what they were saying. But there was a shared assumption of understanding the racial and in some cases the gender dynamics that are present for professional workers that I think came from the fact that I was in a, or that I am in a professional field, generally speaking, that I think overshadowed um, uh, the fact that uh, my discipline and training was so different from theirs as STEM workers. Hi, I'm Talawani. I'm a first year at CMC. And I really felt it when you talked about how the workers described their frustration with diversity training because I grew up with that, being a student who was placed in a predominantly white institution with a program and then going through high school there and going through a lot of workshops and stuff like that seem to benefit 
or focus more on the white experience and using my experience to educate them, but also not seeing the results of that. So I'm wondering, because I grew up with that, when did that start to become a trend, diversity in general? When did you start to see that come up? And what exactly is the point of it or the effect of it if, as you said, it focuses on organizations but still does not affect or doesn't seem to affect society as a whole and professionals interactions with people outside of their organization yeah that's a great question there and there's actually a pretty decent amount of research that tracks kind of this progression and how it happened right so uh my colleague sharon collins has written a book it's an older book it's called black corporate executives but it's the first book i think in sociology that looks at kind of how we get to this point of this mainstreaming of diversity. And what Sharon argues is that in the post-civil rights era, when kind of everything was in flux and changing, a lot of organizations then started to hire more black workers for professional jobs. But what they did was that they hired them in either one of two tracks. They would hire them in what she refers to as the mainstream track, where they might be a corporate counsel or a vice president of marketing or what have you or they would be hired for what she describes as racialized labor. And the racialized jobs were the ones where people were brought in to be uh, uh, vice president of community engagement or urban affairs or something like that. And her argument is that those two tracks served a number of different functions and organizations. They allowed companies to say, look, we're hiring more black people. We get it. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're doing the right thing. So please don't protest and burn down our office. But they also had people in place who were expected to deal with communities of color in the racialized jobs. So if you were hired to be um, an urban affairs director or director of community engagement, uh, organizations either explicitly or implicitly would say or give the message that basically your job is to go deal with the black people and make them not be rowdy, right? And that would include both internally and externally. So. You be our face of good behavior outside of the organization, and then if we have black employees in the organization who are getting upset, you go deal with it and let them know that everything is fine, everything is good. Not surprisingly, what ended up happening was that more black workers got hired into those racialized jobs, which also weren't integrated into management tracks. So these didn't become jobs that led to kind of a uh, CEO or COO position. They kind of dead-ended. But they also suspected that uh, when the politi political economy changed, that they would be out of jobs, right? So my coworker, my colleague Frank Dobbin, who I cited here, picks up kind of after Sharon's book and makes the argument that when the political economy did change and we stopped seeing as much support for affirmative action specifically, what happened is that uh, because once organizations create roles, they tend to be less likely to get rid of them. So uh, managers who had historically been people who were committed to affirmative action had to justify why they still belonged in the organization. And what they did was they transformed from affirmative action to diversity. So instead of being explicitly focused on race and racial issues, they had to broaden what they were doing and make it something that would still fit with the current environment that was less supportive of wanting to be, uh, wanting to bring in more workers of color and address racial and gender issues specifically. So what happens with this shift to diversity is that diversity managers uh, now don't say, well, my job is to kind of deal with racial issues and to try to change the racial climate in the corporation. They say, my job is diversity broadly speaking, so we can have diversity of thought, diversity of opinion, diversity of viewpoints, right? But what that ends up doing is it gives a way for organizations to say, we still care about diversity, but in practice what that means is that nothing changes in terms of systemic problems that might keep out people of color because we're not really talking about that. I don't know if anybody remembers seeing this statement. I paid attention to it because of my research, but it was a vice president of diversity for Apple who a couple of years ago was quoted saying that you can have 10 blonde haired, blue eyed white men in a room and they'll still be diverse because they'll have different viewpoints, right? It sounds crazy, but she actually said that, right? But it goes along with this idea that when we talk about diversity now, it's not about these ideas of addressing racial and gender inequality. It's just about whatever random thing we want it to be about, right? So if we have 12 white men in a room and they're all blonde and blue-eyed, but Chris is left-handed and David is right-handed and Steve is ambidextrous, look what we're doing, it's fantastic, right? <laughs> Without having to pay attention to why the room still looks the same way. So there is some work that does talk about how this progression has happened. and. The result of it, I think, is what you're talking about, that it leaves people who are still being subjected to diversity trainings 
ambivalent at best or annoyed and feeling like their time is being wasted at worst. Hi, Hi. my name's Andy. Thank you for coming to speak today. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, uh, do you think and or how do you think these organizations could help mitigate negative interactions with the public, mm -hmm. not just internal uh, institutional issues, but also external issues in terms of dealing with the public? In terms of dealing with the public? The public and patients coming in and making ignorant judgments mm -hmm. and things like that. How could organizations help? Yeah, that, so that's a great question. I think about that, um, it, or I talk about that some in the conclusion, uh, because I do think, as I said, it's important to be mindful of how different groups are having different experiences, right? And one of the things that I think could be really valuable for technicians in particular is for there to be stricter, clearer hospital policy about uh, kind of patient uh, patient-worker interactions, right? I mean, we know that there's a baseline of certain things that would not be allowed to persist in a hospital, right? So if you had a patient who, like, tried to fight a worker, like, you can't just do that and then still continue to get care, right? Everybody would agree that that's insane and inappropriate and you wouldn't allow that person to stay in the hospital. But apart from kind of really egregious behaviors like that that involve physical violence and things like that, part of how our organizations have shifted is to take on much more of a kind of consumer model in a lot of ways, right? So patients become consumers, they become people whose dollars and payments are valuable and necessary, or by proxy, their services are necessary because of the, pay, the money they can bring in through reimbursements or what have you. And what that does is it creates, um, or it fits into kind of this broader neoliberal marketplace where this idea is that workers have few kind of collective rights because this idea is much more in support of individualism and profits and financing and making money, right? And I th research has shown that those trends have really hurt workers across the board, both economically, socially, uh, emotionally. There's just a lot of evidence to show that the shift in that direction has not been good for workers. So I think that were organizations to kind of take a few steps back from that model, think of workers as people whose job it is to protect and support and stand by. That would necessitate asking, what does this mean if technicians can be verbally abused by patients? And not just technicians. I had the example of a doctor who also had that sort of experience, right? What does it mean if the people who work in our environment can be verbally abused by the people who come here? Is that a thing that we're going to support and stand for and let slide? Or are we going to revisit what sort of policies that we have so that we can say, this is intolerable, and we don't accept patients who will come here and verbally harass our workers and our staff. I think that would be a starting point for organizations to start thinking about how they might reconstruct their relationship with their workers. Thank you so much for your talk. I, you mentioned that healthcare was slowly becoming t a two-tier system, you know, b the separation between private and public, and the fact that you also had the opportunity to follow doctors um, and health professionals in public and private institutions. So I was wondering if you'd seen any trends um, from those follows, yeah. Yeah, so there is a chapter in the book where I talk about this at length, uh, because one of the things that I wanted to focus on was the shrinking public sector and how that under-resourcing is having an impact on black healthcare workers because they are slightly more likely to end up in public sector work than they are in the, the private sector. One of the key things that, excuse me, that I saw and that comes from that research is that um, the under-representation or the under-resourcing of the public sector is something that occurs not just in healthcare but in a lot of um, uh, institutions, higher education is another one, but it has really pronounced consequences for people who work in those settings. I had a lot of doctors and nurses and technicians in the public sector hospital who talked about the constant crush of trying to do more and more with fewer and fewer resources. And interestingly, a lot of uh, black respondents in that setting talked about how the shrinking resources meant that they felt they were expected to step up and do more in ways that felt exploitative and taxing and really dispiriting uh, because they were of the opinion that uh, organizations and management kind of knew that they were in these jobs because they were so committed to patients. And because they knew that, they didn't really fight for or support uh, efforts to stop this kind of tide of resources being sucked out of the organization. That the implicit belief was that 
they kind of don't fight for us because they know that we're here for other reasons and that we're here to do this job, and they just figure they can profit off of this extra work that we're doing. And that was uh, an interesting finding because it spanned occupational lines, that that wasn't just doctors, that was nurses, that was technicians. But I think that the under-resourcing of the private sector is really bleeding a lot of private, excuse me, public sector workers in the sense that when these resources go out and they don't come back in and that um, organizations and workers don't have the support that they need to do their jobs effectively, it exacerbates all of the existing problems that healthcare workers face, the feelings of burnout, the feelings of exhaustion, the feelings of being tired and overworked, all that's even more pronounced when you're in a public sector hospital where you're being underpaid, you don't have the resources, you can't order um, CAT scans or MRIs or whatever for people except for under very certain limited circumstances. So when we talk about this uh, shift between uh, or when I talk about this shift between the, pub, the, pri the sorry, this sector, blah. when I talk about this tiered system of healthcare and the distinction between the public and private forms of how healthcare is, um, is constructed, it's not just having an impact on patients, I think it's having an impact on workers and that the public side of healthcare is closer to kind of collapse and in more danger than perhaps we, we acknowledge and give it credit for being. Hi, uh, my name is Shesha. Um, so I was wondering, you were talking about the decline of unions, and I was formerly a, a member of the Teachers Union of Los Angeles, um, which has been able to do a lot in terms of policies and like really demanding from LAUSD. So I'm wondering, um, looking in healthcare, like what is driving the decline? And also, like while it was a prominent feature um, of healthcare workers, just like their reality, was it able to buffer some of these experiences? So like, were they able to kind of push back on this under-resourcing happening in their institutions? That's a great question. Um, in terms of the decline in unionization, that's happening not just in healthcare, but that's been happening across all sectors since about the 1980s, I think. And there are a number of reasons for that that I think are consistent across occupations. There's uh, little government support for or protections of protection of unions often. Uh, unions are subjected to state and federal and in some cases local policies that make it more and more difficult for them to exist and to function and to do the things that they need to do. And the consequences of that, again, have been documented, that there's greater uh, racial wage inequality without unions in place, that, uh, have, that when unions are present, uh, they actually drive up wages for even non-union workers in ways that we see not being the case in areas where workers are not unionized, so that union presence actually benefits workers across the board because they raise the floor for wages. So this decline is true in healthcare, but it's not happening only in healthcare. It's part of a bigger picture of uh, unions becoming less and less powerful over time, and that that decline is having, having real consequences. Um, I think you asked me a second part of the question. Can you remind me what it was? Oh, right, was specifically these, these, um, these, like, I wouldn't even call them microaggressions at this point, but these, I mean, racist epithets. Mm -hmm essentially. Were unions able to buffer workers from those experiences? Yes. Right, so uh, I do not, so there's, a, I offer kind of a complicated answer in the book. I don't think that unions were able to protect these workers from what they experienced, and a lot of workers did not describe uh, their unions, if they belong to ones, as being uh, safe spaces or sources for support. However, I think that that's actually, uh, I, I think that that's not an argument that unions are less valuable or less important, but I think more of an argument for how, in order for these changes to occur for workers, uh, we need to see at a structural level more support for unions, but unions also have to prioritize the experiences of workers of color in ways that I don't think have happened historically, right? So, I mean, it's just a fact. We know that unions have a history of being racially exclusive and leaving out workers of color, leaving out women in, in certain cases, but I think that a stronger union presence coupled with union presence that focuses on uh, what workers look like today, right? And the fact that the workforce is a lot more racially diverse uh, than it has been because our population is a lot more racially diverse than it has been actually would serve to bolster unions and to protect uh, the types of workers in my study from the sorts of, like you said, macro or microaggressions that they've been experiencing. <laughs> 
I actually have a question. Okay. And I'm going to take an example from your presentation the, uh, of a policy uh, of, or any kind of policy that has a racially disparate impact that might not be obvious to the people making it, namely the requirement that nurses have a bachelor's in nursing. If, if you're someone who wants to have the kind of conversation with whoever makes these decisions saying, hey, you say you want more diversity, but by making this policy, you're actually harming that goal. Do you have any particular advice for people who want to start those kinds of conversations and how to, con how to, convince, how to convince the bosses, the executives? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that the issue is not so much um, not to raise the standards, but to think about what barriers might be in place for people who are interested in the profession, right? So if you're going to say nurses need to have a four-year bachelor's degree and that this is going to be our baseline, okay, but also think about who might, as you mentioned, who's being left out by that change, and how can you also think about policies that might offset that, right? How do you make it easier to access higher education? How do you deal with uh, people who may live in areas where there is not a nursing program, but they want to attend nursing school. What sorts of policies can you put in place so that you're not just raising the standards, but you're making sure that you're taking away some of the disparities that make it harder for interested, qualified applicants to get, th get to and get through these programs in the first place? And I think especially if we're talking about policymakers, and what they do is make policy, right? There's room to think about not only the implications of those policies, but how we can structure a number of different policies in ways that give more people more access to more things. And I think fundamentally, at least to me, the core of this comes down to thinking about what sort of society we have and what sort of society we're going to live in, right? If we live in a society, and we do, that's becoming increasingly multiracial and where uh, people of color are going to be uh, in the majority in about 20 or 30 years, how do we reconcile that with a society that continues to maintain racial disparities? It's not productive for having a future or a country, right? And so on a smaller scale level of that, if we're talking about raising standards for nursing, how do we also reconcile the idea of raising these standards with the fact that more likely than not, in the future, your nurse has a good shot of being a person of color, right? If that's the case, then do you want barriers in place for people who are going to be accessing this profession and dealing with a population that's largely going to be a population of color? Do we have any more questions? All right. Um, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Please join me in thanking Ms. Adia Harvey Wingfield. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wingfield's book is available in the lobby if anyone would like to further explore her work. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I apologize for the coughing spate. I don't know what, I, yeah, I don't know what that was, but. <laughs>